All right. Now, by way of review, we're just going to review real quick. Um, does anybody know the name of the series that we've been in? Anybody know the name of the series that we've been in? What was it, Bree? Sufficient. Yes, well done. It's called sufficient. And what does the word sufficient mean? Enough, right? Enough for a particular purpose, right? That's what we talk about when we talk about Jesus being enough. He's enough for a particular purpose. He's enough for salvation. He's enough to surrender our lives to. He's enough to build as the foundation of our lives. And we have kind of talked through Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 so far. And today we're going to look at, what are we going to read today? Do you remember? Yes, Colossians 1, 9 through 12. If you just need help, Giada, just look down. And it's like, it's right there, right? Oh, it's upside down. You should, next time you should write it so you can read it. Yeah, there you go. Colossians 1, 9 through 12 is where we're going to be today. But before we get there, um, we're just going to do a little bit of review. So if you remember from week one, we talked through Colossians 1, 1 through 2, and we spent a lot of time focusing in on this highlighted portion to the saints in Christ at Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we spent time talking about what does it mean to be a saint? What does it mean to be a faithful brother or sister in Christ? And that theme is going to carry throughout this letter where Paul is talking to them about what does it mean to like actually follow Jesus? Like to actually believe this, to actually live it out in daily life where things get hard, life's kind of messy, and stuff doesn't always go your way. Like what does it look like to follow Jesus in the midst of that? And so we've talked through some of those things. We also talked through uh, last week about what does it mean to have faith in Jesus? What does it mean to actually believe in him and to have our, our faith in Jesus Christ? And we defined faith as this way, uh, to be persuaded that something is true and to trust in it, right? To be persuaded that something is true and to trust in it, to be persuaded that Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life and paid perfectly the price of your sins as he was crucified on the cross, as he was buried in the tomb, and as he was resurrected three days later. To be persuaded that it's true and to trust in the reality of that, to put your trust in that, that that is where the forgiveness of your sins comes from. It is through faith in Jesus Christ, not because you came to church, not because you have changed your behavior, not because like you try hard, not because of your ability or capacity, it is by faith in Jesus Christ. And so it involves then obedience. True saving faith contains repentance and obedience as its elements. We talked about how repentance is a change of mind. It's a, a way of thinking differently about God. It's a, a way of thinking differently about our sin. It's a way of thinking differently about the world that we live in. Because when you spend any time in the world that we live in, you see that the world is, is telling you something. They're telling you, this is what true beauty looks like. This is what dating should look like. This is what you should be as a man. This is what you should be as a woman. And, and it tells you these things but often those things are completely detached from any bearing that God would have on those definitions and those identity markers and, and that way of living. And so as we think about changing the way that we think, we begin to think differently according to what the scriptures say about who you are, about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, what it means to, to live in this world and, and to really satisfy every desire of your heart. Because the scriptures actually tell us that when we delight in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our hearts. And it's not because he wants to give us everything that we want. It's because when we delight ourselves in the Lord, it means we desire for our lives the things that he desires for our lives. And that's why he grants them to us because they match as we delight ourselves in him. And so we've talked through some of these things. We talked about how uh, faith in Jesus leads to a changed life. Faith in Jesus leads to a changed life. We can't just believe in Jesus and nothing be impacted, right? These are blanks from previous weeks, so they're not in your handout right now. It's just review. Uh, so if you're wondering, like, wait, I don't have that blank. You're right. You're, you're not being misled. This is from previous weeks. But faith in Jesus leads to a changed life. And last week, we ended with talking about these seeds that we plant, 
every single day you are planting seeds in your life that are going to bear fruit to something, to help you become a certain kind of person. And so we asked, what kind of fruit will your life bear? Like, what kind of seed are you planting right now? Seeds in your friendship, seeds in your spiritual life, seeds in your personal life, seeds in your private life, seeds in in your intellect, seeds in in your emotional life, seeds in, in your mental life, seeds in your physical life. Like, what kind of seeds are you planting? Because whatever kind of seed you plant is what fruit is going to come from it. Like if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get an orange from an apple seed, right? You're going to get apples from an apple seed. Same thing, you plant a pineapple, you're going to get pineapple from that. You're not going to get bananas, right? You're going to get the fruit of the seed that you plant. And so that brings us to today. And we're going to start with this question just for, for something for you to think about as we step into the lesson for today and look at Colossians 1, 9 through 12, is thinking through what does it really cost to actually follow Jesus? What does it really cost to actually follow Jesus? And this is a question that is going to have a different answer depending on who we're talking to. And so you're going to have an answer that is going to be different than my answer because faithfully following Jesus, like actually following Jesus is going to, sometimes it costs us very similar things, but also sometimes it costs very unique things to you or to me. There are certain things that that you cannot do and certain things that you must do, and there's costs that come with those things. And so what does it really take or really cost to actually follow Jesus, because it will cost you something. We often talk about salvation as this free gift of God that is given to us. And yes, it is a free gift of God. You don't earn your way into salvation. You believe in Jesus and you are saved. But once you are saved and that faith leads to a changed way of living, it costs you something. It might cost you, well, it definitely costs you pride. (laughs) It costs you your ego. It costs you a lot of things that need to change because you follow Jesus. You don't follow the ways of the world. So what does it really cost to actually follow Jesus? Something for you to think about, something to to take with you to small group. And then the follow-up question, as we think about that cost, are you willing to pay it? Are you willing to pay the price of what it actually costs to follow Jesus? It's not always easy. Now, it's easier to follow Jesus in a group like this. It's easier because you have people around you who are trying to do the same thing. Now, raise your hand if you're perfect. Okay, so no one has their hand up, Rocco. Um, Just kidding. But none of us is perfect. Your leaders aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. Like, no one in here, Pastor Jeff's not perfect. Like, none of us are perfect. And the reality of that is like, yeah, sometimes we're going to mess up. Sometimes we're going to wrong each other. Sometimes we're going to sin against each other. And, and those things are going to come as we spend time in relationship with one another. But that's one of the reasons, going back to Colossians 1, uh, 1 and 2, as, as Paul calls them brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a, a family element to this where it's easier to do these things together. Now, what our enemy wants to do is he wants to drive us apart so that we are alone. He wants to drive us apart to think that, that we are the only one struggling with some temptation. He wants to drive us into this place where we bring ourselves to, the, to where we, we feel like we're isolated and, and we're drawn away from godly community at times because we want to protect our pride, right? Our pride is, is this, this protector between us and other people actually speaking into our lives because we don't want to confess like, hey, I'm dealing with this. Like, this is where my thoughts go, or this is where my eyes go, or this is where, like, whatever, like, this is the temptation that I'm dealing with. And and I don't want to be honest about that because you might think less of me, right? That's often a reason that we don't share something is because we fear it's going to change, like, negatively impact someone else's opinion of us. And if it does negatively impact someone's opinion of you, that's between them and God. Like that doesn't, that, that shouldn't be something that keeps us from confessing things. That shouldn't be something that keeps us from being honest. Now you have to do it appropriately. You can't trust everybody with everything in your life because not everybody has proven that trustworthiness. And so there are times where you have to be careful with that. But knowing good godly community and being within that, not just being with people who, who are gonna tell you what you wanna hear, but being with people who are going to challenge you in the ways that you're thinking, in the ways that you're living. Are you willing to pay that price? Because ultimately it takes humility to have faith in Jesus. 
Humility is like, there's this famous quote from C.S. Lewis that says like, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? So you're not like belittling yourself and saying like, oh, I'm no good. Like, oh, I can't do anything. Like, no, it's thinking of yourself less. It's putting others first. It's not thinking that you're just like bad at everything and no good. Like that's negative self-talk. That's not helpful. That's not from the Lord. Do you have a question? Yes, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? So most of us, when we take a picture, so like later when I post your uh, team cheer for seniors, right? Probably, yeah. So who will you look for first in that video? Yourself, right? We're just naturally drawn to that. That's just what happens is when we look at a picture, it's a good picture if I look good in it. If you don't look good, uh, sorry, Lola. Sorry, I'm still gonna post it because I look good. You know, it's like, it's one of those things, like if I look good in it, then it's a good picture. If I don't look good in it, it's a bad picture, right? And, uh, and that's because we're thinking of ourselves more than we're thinking of others. And, and so in humility, we're thinking of ourselves less. We're thinking of others more. We are a servant to others. We, we take ourself off the pedestal and we actually start to think about like, okay, I could say this because I want to say this, but if I say this, here's how it's going to impact other people, right? We start to, start to think with a different sort of mindset that's not just about us. It's thinking how our actions and our words and our different things like impact the people around us and how we might be able to serve them in that. So it takes humility to have faith in Jesus. It takes humility to, to release that control and to lay our desires down at the feet of Jesus, and so sometimes we, we need this thing called intercession. We need help, right? We can't do this on our own. And so the, the verses that we're going to look at today are really the, this prayer of intercession that Paul is going to pray for the Colossians. Now, you might hear that word and you're like, hey, what is intercession? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's a blank on your notes page. What is intercession? Well, it's defined for you. So the word there, the blank there is intercession, And intercession, just at its basis level, is simply praying to God on behalf of someone else or praying to God for someone else. So when you pray to God for someone else to grow in their faith or somebody dealing with something or or whatever it might be, you are interceding for them. Like you are going to God for them. Does that make sense? Yes? Anybody confused by what intercession is? Excellent. All right. So what is intercession? It's simply praying to God on behalf of someone else. And so when we pray for others, God hears us and God is moved to action. And when we pray for others, it doesn't just help them out. It doesn't just reach the ear of God. But when we pray for other people, it also starts to change us. And so that's one of the reasons why Jesus taught us to, to not just uh, love our, like love people who love us and not just love our enemies, but to actually pray for those who persecute you. And why would you pray for somebody who is wronging you? Well, when you pray for somebody, it changes the way that you see them. When you pray for somebody, you start to see them through the eyes of your heavenly father. When you pray for somebody, it starts to change your heart towards them. And you think of them not just in like physical terms, not just in mental, emotional terms. You think of them in spiritual terms and you wonder, man, hurt people hurt people. And people who are are doing the work of the enemy are are actively working against what he's trying to do in my heart, in my life. And so what I need to do is I need to pray for that person because, yeah, they said some hard things to me. They said some mean things to me or they did something mean to me. But the reality is, like, they probably need Jesus just as much as I do. And so when we pray for somebody else, it changes the way that we look at them, the way that we treat them. And so... As we look at this prayer, there there really is a lot here, and we're going to need to go a little bit quickly because it's already pretty late. So we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. In the book of Colossians, it's page 804, if you got a Bible from us. So page 804. Or if you don't have a Bible from us, you need to go to the table of contents, go to the New Testament section, look for the book of Colossians. It's about like a third of the way or so through the New Testament. Colossians Chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, says this. For this reason, since the day that we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives 
so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. So we're going to break this down a little bit, uh, section by section. So we see in Colossians 1, 9, and 10 that he's praying, and he says, We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. He's praying in such a way so that we might please the Lord in every single way of our lives, that we might actually be able to live a life worthy of the Lord. Now, when we think about living a life worthy of the Lord, is anybody intimidated a little bit by that? Like, I read that, and I'm like, ooh, like, I, I see my own anger. I see my own sin. I see my own frustration. I see my, my own stuff. Like, that's, that's not, I feel like, living worthy of the Lord, right? And I immediately start to, like, just put myself against myself, and it's like, man, like, that sounds impossible to live a life worthy of the Lord, now, he says in verse 9, though, where does the knowledge of his will and the wisdom and understanding, who, who gives these things? What does it say? Who? The Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit of God is one who gives these things. He gives us the understanding. He gives us the wisdom. He gives us the discernment. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who helps us in these moments. We don't live worthy of the Lord because we are worthy of the Lord. We live worthy of the Lord as we are surrendered to him. As we obey him, we could say it this way. We, we can live a life worthy of the Lord as we draw near to him each and every day, whether it's coming to church or it's being in uh, reading the Bible or it's spending time in prayer or it's being with God's, uh, God's people and, and being together in godly community. We can live a life worthy of the Lord as we draw near to him each and every day because as we draw near to him, our desires are going to be his desires, our delight is going to be his delight. So Paul gets specific and he says, like, these are some ways that we can please God. Now, that's the next blank there is we please God through, and then all these other things that he lists. We please God through, and he gives us some specific ways that we can do this. So the first one, we please God through bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work. Now, Paul makes an assumption here as he writes about bearing fruit in every good work. What Paul assumes is that the Colossians are doing good work, right? He assumes that this is true of their lives. And he says, hey, as you are doing these good works, these are seeds that you're planting. And the seeds that you're planting, what do seeds do when you plant them? They grow. They bear fruit. And so as you are doing these good works, they bear fruit, and so we bear fruit in every good work. And he, he's praying specifically about the good work that they're doing, that that would bear fruit. Now, if you're praying, remember, we're going to like take our time through this. We're going to like think more deeply about this. So if Paul's writing about bearing fruit in good works, what does he leave out? If you're talking about good works, what are you not talking about? bad works, right? We got to think a little bit about this, but when you start to think about it, there's something that he leaves out. If we're going to bear fruit in every good work, then the reverse is also true. He's essentially praying the, the reverse when he says bearing fruit in every good work and, and not bearing fruits in the bad works, right? Because he knows that we all make mistakes. He knows that there are going to be some times that we don't always plant the right seed. And so there's this reality. He, he's praying for the things that we are doing that are obeying God's will for us. And he's saying, those are the things that I'm praying for that will bear fruit. And so when we think about this prayer, this is a, a prayer that we can pray for ourselves. This is a prayer that, that honestly, like we've given to our leaders to pray for you. When we first had our leader meeting before fall kickoff, I gave them this verse and said, hey, if you're wondering what to pray for your small group, pray this. And so we gave them this, like these verses to, to pray through for you. And each of you is actually going to get one of these cards. It's got our little sufficient logo on it. And then on the back, it has very small when you're this far away. But when you're close to it, you can see it. Uh, and it has Colossians 1, 9 through 12 on it. And we're going to give this to you in small groups so that you can take this with you and remember it. You can pray it for yourself. 
remember it so you can pray it for someone else. And it's small enough that like it should be able to fit in like your like phone case or fit like on your bathroom mirror or like wherever you might see it every day. It's small enough to, to fit in those places uh, so that you can remind yourself to pray. So bearing fruit in every good work. Now remember, these good works aren't just things that you do. These aren't ways to, to work to salvation. These are things that flow out of relationship with God. And so we bear fruit because our life has changed. The way that we think has changed. Having faith in Jesus has changed the way that we live our life. And so as we have this faith in Jesus, good works flow out of it. And he prays that we would bear fruit in every good work. Then he says that we would grow or that we would be growing in the knowledge of God. Growing in the knowledge of God. Now, I don't know all that much about grammar, but what I do know is a word like growing has this idea to it, and I actually looked it up. Um, let's see, did I write it down? Oh yes, it's in the present continuous tense. Now, I have no idea what that means. Present continuous tense. We gotta take it word by word. Present tense, I know it's right now, like it's happening right now, but present continuous means that it's now and ongoing, like it keeps going, right? So this present continuous tense, when he says growing in the knowledge of God, it's not just like, okay, you went to church on Sunday once, like you're good to go. You grew. He says that you would be growing in the knowledge of God, that it would be an ongoing, continuous habit of growing, right? A continuous habit of growing in our knowledge of God. Now, again, it's talking about your mind, but it's not just intellectual knowledge about God. Part of my testimony in coming to faith in Jesus is that I started out knowing in my head a lot about the Bible, knowing in my head a lot of verses, knowing in my head a lot of the things about Jesus, but I didn't know him. And so this knowledge that they're talking about it is not intellectual. It's not about your mind so much as, as it is your heart, right? So it, you, you need to take it from like this intellectual understanding about who God is and like know him by experience. Something is different when you experience it for yourself. And so he's calling us to, to be growing in this knowledge, to experience God and continue to have this habit of growing and experiencing him, a continuous habit of growing. The next thing, the next way that we can please God is by being strengthened by him so we might endure and be patient. So that we might endure and be patient. The reality is we live in a world that is constantly working against us, constantly pulling us away from the Lord, constantly trying to point us to a different sort of God, a different ruler than the one true God. And so in this world, we need to endure and we need to have patience because without those things, we're not going to be able to stand the test very long. We need this endurance and this patience. And again, the, the verse in verse 11 says that we are strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. And so again, we are strengthened with all power, not by our own willpower, not by our own strength, not by our own ability, not by our own family, not by our own personality. We are strengthened according to his glorious might. God is the one who strengthens us. God is the one who gives us endurance and patience in this world that we live in. Now, the only way to get it from him is to go to him. So again, we please God as we draw near to him daily. As we come close to him, we're able to receive his endurance and his patience through his glorious might. We have to draw near to him if we're going to do this. So God has given us this gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit um, is given to everyone who believes in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is, in, in the scriptures, called our, our paraclete or our advocate. He's called our helper. Those are all similar words. Like paraclete is the Greek, and he's, he's called our, our advocate, our helper. He's the one who comes and, and comes alongside and, and helps us. He convicts us of sin. So the Holy Spirit of God is a gift given to you if you believe in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the one who, who convicts you in your sin, who helps you actually walk faithfully the road that God has for you. The Bible says that if we walk in step with the Spirit, we won't satisfy the desires of our flesh. Because we're following 
our advocate. We're following our helper, our guide along the way. And so the Holy Spirit is a gift given to us. And so when we think about this gift and we think about this endurance and this patience that we need, we go back to the beginning talking about the cost. So we have these two costs. The cost of following Jesus leads to a joy-filled reward. The cost of following Jesus leads to a joy-filled reward. A joy-filled reward. That doesn't mean that things are always going to go your way. It doesn't mean that things are always going to be exciting. Things are always going to be positive. Things are always going to be just, like, wonderful. Life is hard sometimes. But even in the hard, God is good. Even in challenging and painful circumstances, there's still joy to be had in the Lord. Again, not because of the circumstance or the situation, but because of who God is and the work that he is doing in and through us. And so the cost of following Jesus leads to a joy-filled reward, and the cost of following the world leads to a pain-filled reward. A pain-filled reward. You see, when we follow the ways of the world, it promises one thing, but the only thing that it ever actually delivers is guilt and shame and pain and regret. And maybe not always immediate. Oftentimes it is immediate, but not always. Right? You've experienced where when you get away with something, it feels good. When you get away with something, it kind of makes you want to try to do it again, right? And, and so we're tempted to, to do it again and again because we weren't caught. And we think that it doesn't actually do any damage to us or others. It doesn't hurt anybody else. It doesn't really hurt me. But it, it actually does because it's drawing you away from God. It's drawing you away from relationship to him because what you are saying to him is, hey, part of me wants to live in your kingdom, but most of me really, like my heart wants to live in a different kingdom. And you, you live in a divided sort of way that can only end in one of two directions. Either continuing down that trajectory towards a life separated from God forever or in repentance and, and turning from that sin and turning into the way of the Lord and following the Holy Spirit of God and walking in step with him. It can only go one of two ways, towards the joy-filled kingdom of God or the pain-filled kingdom of darkness. We'll talk more about that next week. So Paul continues, and he says this last point. He says, giving joyful thanks. Another way we please God is giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his kingdom and the way of living. We give joyful thanks to the Father. You see, the more that we understand who he is, the more that we grow in our knowledge of who God is, the more grateful it makes us because we recognize like God doesn't have to do any of this. He did not have to offer Jesus. He does not have to continue to, to be in relationship with us or to pursue us in the way that he does. So why does he? It's because he is our loving heavenly father who desires to be in relationship with you. He loves you so much that he pursues you even when you don't deserve it. He doesn't pursue you because of your deserving nature. He serves you because of his character and his nature as our loving father. So as we think about this cost and we think about who God is, we come to this final point on your handout that says there is no part of your life that is left out from the call to please God. There's no part that's left out. There's no part that's left out. So what that means is that if there is something that you are leaving out, then you are not following what this is, is calling you to. <laughs> then you are not fully paying the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And so there's this reflection question. And just for the sake of time, like we don't have a whole lot of time to spend looking into this. But again, there's no part of your life that is left out from the call to please God. And so I just want you to think about this. We're just going to, we're not going to take minutes and minutes. We're just going to think quickly and then we're going to dismiss to small group. But where in your life are you tempted to try to hold back, to try to leave something out instead of fully follow the way of Jesus with every part of you? Where are you tempted to go 50% or 80% or even 95% but not the whole way? So where are you tempted to do these things and then why? Why are you tempted to withhold something from surrendering it to the Lord? Is it because of your pride? 
Is it just because of, of comfort? Is it because of, of you, it makes you feel safe or it, it satisfies some longing in your heart that, that you feel like if you just committed fully to the Lord that, that that peace would be missing because you're not trusting that what he can provide for you is better than what you could provide for yourself? What is holding you back and why? Just think about it for a second. It'd be a great place to go to in your small group is to ask yourself, is there something that I'm leaving out from surrendering to the Lord? What am I holding back? I forgot to put it in your notes, but if you want to write this down, we've been ending each time with this, when we believe Jesus is enough. And so this last point, when we believe Jesus is enough, we do surrender every part of our lives to him because we fully trust him, because we fully believe and buy into the reality that he is enough. He's enough to satisfy every longing and desire of our hearts. And so we surrender every part of our lives to him because we trust that his way is better. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dismiss to small groups. We do have one small group room change. I don't know if everyone's aware of it, but who's in the high school room normally? Anybody know the first room on the right? You have been in there recently. So the senior girls are going to move to that room, and then that means the other room would be open if you want to move to that one, just for, like, spacing and seating. Uh, there's a lot more seats in that, in that room. So we're going to pray, and then we'll dismiss you by small group. Um, so I'll let you know who's going when. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. And, uh, and Lord, we pray that, that you, would, you would show us clearly in our lives, Lord, that we wouldn't pretend, we wouldn't try to, to trick ourselves or to trick others, but we would be fully and brutally honest, that we would have the courage to be honest with ourselves and the courage to be honest with someone else, to say where we don't want to surrender to you. Maybe we're afraid or we're proud or we want to be in control or we don't trust you. I pray that you would help us to be honest and then to work through those things, to allow you to work in our hearts, to draw us into full surrender. We know it's not easy, but you have sent your helper to guide us, to be our advocate. Holy Spirit, show us the way. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.